Thank you, Kaiser, and thank you, Charles, and thanks very much to the ESPR for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about aerosolisation, which I think is uh, providing some very interesting developments in terms of truly non-invasive uh, surfactant therapy. So I do have some disclosures to make that I will be uh, discussing off-label use of surfactant, uh, namely CuraSurf during this uh, presentation. And that's uh, because we'll be discussing the results of our QNEB trial. The trial or the nebulizers for the QNEB trial were provided by PARI. Um, and I should disclose that Stefan Minicieri, who was a co-investigator on the trial, does have a patent together with PARI for nebulization with a vibrating membrane. The surfactant for our trial was actually purchased from our hospital pharmacy um, and was funded by the State Health uh, Department of Western Australia uh, Research Grant. However, I have received surfactant for animal research from Chiesi uh, in the past, and Fisher and Paikel provided the uh, CPAP circuits for the study, and I've uh, had um, given expert opinion to FMP for FDA purposes before uh, for bubble CPAP and I've also received unrestricted educational grants from FMP for research in the past. So with that uh, all aside, um, I'd like to um, outline what we're going to do in the talk. I should just point out that uh, despite what Peter said about all the beauty being over in the southeast, that Perth is indeed a beautiful place. Yes, there are a few large um, animals lurking in the sea here, but uh, truly WA is a wonderful place and I urge you to come visit us. So what we're going to do is review the principles of and the past evidence for surfactant aerosolization. I'm going to present the results of the QNEB trial and then discuss future directions for nebulized surfactant therapy. So just as way of background, surfactant, as you've heard, currently is approved for bolus treatment only. However, we have that increasing trend towards more use of non-invasive ventilation, either as first intention or step-down treatment after a brief intubation. And as Peter uh, outlined earlier, that CPA patients either miss out on surfactant, have delayed intubation in surfactant, or have non-invasive uh, so-called instrumentation of the trachea and bolus surfactant treatment. Bolus surfactant, um, as you've heard, requires specialist skills, and that is particularly difficult for remote patients, which in my state is a, a big issue in terms of necessitating transfer to a level three unit, sometimes uh, that is thousands of kilometers away for some of our patients. Reinstrumentation is necessary if you're going to give a repeat dose unless you keep your patient intubated and ventilated. And as you've heard, sometimes patients require sedation and analgesia, uh, and that could also compromise subsequent spontaneous breathing efficacy. Bolus surfactant itself has some complications in terms of airway obstruction, such as apnea, bradycardia, transient hypoxia, also uh, hypertension, altered cerebral blood flow, and potential inhomogeneous spread if you're using positive pressure uh, to distribute the surfactant. So, why, uh, why use nebulized surfactant? Well, it truly is um, less invasive and potentially has fewer side effects. It does not require any specialist skills, and therefore it's particularly apt for use in regional and outlying centres, and reduces the transfer to uh, tertiary centres potentially, which could uh, result in reduced health costs for the system, as well as geographical separation for the mums and their babies. And I just put um, up here a um, picture of Western Australia. This is my state, and the red dot is Perth. That's uh, the only tertiary uh, perinatal centre in the whole of the state. And just uh, superimposed on that is both Europe and um, various states in the US, uh, just to illustrate the kind of distances that we're talking about um, transferring. I'll say that if you ever decide to come out uh, and do some clinical work with us as a junior registrar, you quite probably will end up flying over a fair bit of this state during your retrievals, and the scenery is dramatic. Okay, so past studies um, largely have been hampered, I think, by inefficient nebulizer systems and the lack of any lasting clinical benefit. benefit. However, the concept of nebulization is not new, and this is actually a publication from uh, 1964, uh, which was uh, uh, published by Robillard and colleagues, 
and describing the use of nebulizing a 0.25%, so very dilute solution of um, uh, phospholipids into incubators of infants that had respiratory distress. And they, um, I'm just going to concentrate in this busy slide, but just concentrating on the retraction scores here. Their first three patients actually were very sick, and as you can see, all three uh, died. But they were buoyed by the fact that the nebulization process didn't itself seem to have any negative effect on the infants, and they went on to then try this in eight other babies. Three of those um, eight babies only required one exposure or one lot of nebulization therapy to see a marked reduction in their retraction score, whilst after the second dose, you could see further reductions in the remaining five. So this suggested that even just spraying a mist into an incubator of a, um, a phospholipid compound was sufficient to have some kind of clinical effect. Obviously, this was not a, a randomized controlled trial. Okay, it was then uh, about 30 years before uh, there was much more work done on this. This is a slide from a paper in 1991 from Alan Job's group in 130 to 132 day uh, preterm lambs. Uh, these lambs received three hours of continuous nebulization, 110 milligrams per kilo in total of surfactant and what they found, um, and they compared, sorry, I should say, see if I can get this pointer to work, yeah. So they compared uh, three uh, surfactant groups, two nebulized, one uh, nebulized Fanta, one nebulized natural surfactant, and also an instilled bolus uh, natural surfactant, and compared that to a nebulized saline uh, group. And all three groups that received the surfactant um, had much improved compliance, as you can see on these pressure uh, volume curves obtained at study uh, completion, but also improved ventilation efficiency index and oxygenation. However, with the nebulization, what they found was that most of the surfactant they'd given was actually trapped in the filter, the T-piece, and the expiratory tubing of the jet nebulizer device they were using. So actually only 1.9 to 2.7 percent of the surfactant they administered actually got down into the lung. And clearly, um, that's not a, a huge proportion if you're talking about an expensive drug. Nonetheless, it seemed that they could achieve a clinical effect with only two to three milligrams per kilo of surfactant reaching the distal organ. And I think that that uh, tells us something in terms of how much we need to actually achieve some clinical benefit. Surfactant uh, nebulization may have some other benefits, and this is uh, a group of studies done uh, on rabbits by um, Deakin co-workers, where they analyzed a surfactant distribution, um, comparing nebulization to bolus instilled. So on the x-axis here, um, down at the bottom, is telling you about the amount of surfactant found in various lung pieces. And the y-axis is telling you how many lung pieces had that amount of surfactant. So what you can see here is that in the bolus surfactant group, that a large number of pieces had very small amounts of surfactant, and some pieces had huge amounts of surfactant, and then there was a wide variation in terms of the amount of, of surfactant in the remaining lung pieces. Sorry. However, in the nebulization group, there is a much more Gaussian distribution in terms of the distribution of the surfactant with the vast majority of lung uh, pieces having relatively similar amounts of surfactant. Notably, however, there was um, one area of the lung, and that was the right upper lobe, that seemed to get an unusually large amount of surfactant distributed to it. There was no difference in pulmonary blood flow uh, distribution in this study between the two methods. However, I would point out that there was a difference in terms of mean blood pressures and cerebral blood flow. So the solid black line in these uh, diagrams are the bolus surfactant, and you'll see the very sudden uh, decrease in mean arterial blood pressure, and similarly also in cerebral blood flow associated with administration of a bolus dose of surfactant to the lung, versus the much more gradual and lesser magnitude changes in each of those parameters seen with the nebulized surfactant group. So potentially there are some other benefits of uh, surfactant therapy and this uh, truly less invasive approach.
There's no such thing as a free lunch, however, and uh, this slide will show you that after uh, two hours, the uh, bolus surfactant group here, um, that the effect in terms of the oxygenation, which had improved over the first two hours, appeared to be lost um, subsequently, and that they had slightly higher CO2s throughout the entire study. So this was also with a, a jet nebulizer system delivering very small proportions of surfactant to the actual lung. So far, there's been relatively little work done uh, in humans. These uh, three studies, first three studies here, are all done with uh, jet nebulizers, which, as I've said already, have a relatively inefficient developer, um, deliver very small amounts to the lung. One of those three studies uh, did show a difference, and that being the, the York study from uh, 1997, which also used uh, bubble CPAP in the delivery uh, process. However, each of these jet, um, three JET studies delivered the surfactant in the uh, inspiratory limb or in the bias flow, resulting in marked uh, dilution of the surfactant that's delivered to the lung. Jork study uh, showed some improvement, and in fact, this was quite an immediate improvement in oxygenation, reduction in CO2, and uh, decrease in the Silverman score, with only 30% uh, intubated. It's only been one uh, randomized controlled trial with all of that, and that was uh, from Bergeron in 2000, relatively small randomized controlled trial, just 32 uh, patients, showing no change in um, the outcomes that it showed uh, for the, the jet nebulization that they did. Neil Finer um, published in 2010, sorry, I keep jumping here, uh, an uncontrolled open label uh, pilot feasibility and safety study using one of the newer generation vibrating membrane um, uh, nebulizers. And th in this case, it was uh, Aeroneb. They had a dilute solution of Aerosurf that they nebulized continuously for three hours and then allowed up to three redosing over 48 hours. But some uh, patients received up to 1,100 milligrams of surfactant in that study. They uh, observed that it was well tolerated. They did see an improvement in oxygenation within six hours and only had a 30% requiring um, intubation. So um, just to remind you, most of the studies so far have used these jet nebulizers, which deliver very, very small percentages of surfactant down to the lung. What we uh, used for our study uh, is this um, Pari eFlow neb nebulizer. This was an investigational device, but a relatively a low dead space device, uh, which was positioned right at the um, connector to the face mask and which we've shown, or Stephen Carey has shown in bench tests, be able to deliver more than 20% of the dose to the actual lung. It has some uh, particular benefits, particularly including a very small res um, retain of the uh, dose within the device itself. So the CureNeb study is using um, CureSurf, the eFlow uh, nebulizer, um, had the purpose of looking at, in preterm infants, 29 to 33 plus six weeks gestation, less than four hours postnatal age with mild RDS. So they had to have an oxygen requirement, more than 21%, but less than 30%. And this will illustrate to you that this really was a pilot trial, um, and it was undertaken in a unit that uh, routinely uh, gives or administers surfactant to infants requiring more than 30% oxygen. We asked the question, does nebulized surfactant compared to standard CPAP care reduce the risk of CPAP failure requiring intubation? And the time interval for that was in the first 72 hours of life. So it's a single center, blinded, randomized controlled trial. It was approved by a human ethics committee at our hospital. It was registered with the Australian Clinical Trials Registry. We had permuted block randomization with sealed, opaque numbered envelopes um, through a computer generated uh, randomization scheme. Separate study uh, team for the randomization and treatment and therefore the clinical caregivers were unaware of the particular treatment assignment. The mass data analysis was done by myself as I had relatively minimal involvement in the randomization and treatment. This was our study design. We aimed to recruit 70 patients in this uh, gestational age uh, group. 
and divided that into two substrata, being the 29 to 31 plus six weeks versus the 32 to 33 weekers. And within each of those two groups, uh, aim to have control and nebulized uh, subgroups. We uh, calculate an 80% power to detect a reduction in intubation from 30 to 5% in the population of infants requiring CPAP. Uh, this is just showing you the device that we used. So this is a simple uh, battery-powered or AC-powered uh, device that can be carried around very light, very portable. And this is the, um, sorry, this is the uh, device that goes at the airway opening. It's a vibrating membrane nebulizer. The um, MMAD is of 2.5 microns. The um, output rate is 0.15 mils per minute. We applied it using a face mask um, and together with bubble CPAP. We used a dry heated circuit uh, for the administration to try and avoid um, additional moisture being absorbed by the surfactant droplets that would increase their particle size. And the surfactant uh, was administered as 200 milligram per kilo for the first dose. And then if a second dose was required, i.e. persisting oxygen requirement, 100 milligram per kilo was used. And this is reflecting our normal surfactant practice in our unit. So the inclusion criteria, I've said the gestation, they had to be less than four hours of postnatal age, clinical or radiological signs of RDS, an FiO2 of 0.22 to 0.3 to maintain a peripheral oxygen saturation of 88 to 94, which at the time was what our oxygen saturation range was, and also informed parental consent. They uh, were excluded if they had prior intubation or surfactant treatment, a known pneumothorax, obvious major chromosomal abnormation, uh, aberrations or complex diseases that would interfere with the uh, conduct of the study. So the CPAP failure criteria, uh, they had to have one of these four, um, either FiO2 exceeding 0.35 for greater than 30 minutes or 0.45 at any time. And this, again, you'll see reflects uh, our unit's policy in terms of early surfactant treatment. pH could be less than, um, less than 7.2 or CO2 greater than 65. Gradin for apneas within an hour, or two apneas requiring bag and mask ventilation within an hour, or clinical deterioration necessitating intubation, which was a request of the clinical treating group. Primary outcomes that we had was need for intubation in the first 72 hours, um, secondary outcomes, apnea, suction, or any other need for medical intervention during nebulization, the number of surfactant treatments, time to intubation, the proportion intubated, one, three, and seven days, the duration of mechanical ventilation, duration of oxygen supplementation, and uh, BPD at uh, 36 weeks, air leak, neck, and IVH. This is just showing you the consort statement for the study. Uh, we had 606 infants who were potentially eligible for the study. Of those, 246 were ineligible, either because they had been intubated before surfactant, uh, sorry, before CPAP was applied. 172 had no CPAP or ventilation at any time, and three were on CPAP, but no oxygen requirement on day one. That left us with 360 who were eligible for the study, of which 296 weren't randomized, either because they had weaned to air before consent was obtained, or they were not approached. And uh, then eventually we had 64 randomized to our study. Um, of those 64, we actually filled our um, criteria for the younger gestational age subgroup and fell six short in the older group. We did uh, recruit from October 2010 until May 2012. We closed six patients early, largely because of slowed recruitment, no ongoing funding, and actually the main reason was the primary recruiter had returned uh, to Switzerland at that point was analysed using intention to treat. This is just showing you uh, the demographics of the population. So um, very similar gestations between the two groups, very similar birth weights. There was no difference in birth weight Z score, but uh, if anything, the nebulised group was a slightly underweight compared to the control group. Uh, similar proportions of male and over 90% uh, steroid administered to both groups. There was, interestingly, uh, quite a high proportion of caesarean section within the group, 
uh, that we studied. So this slide is showing you now the primary outcome, and that is the probability that uh, infants remained not intubated uh, for the first 72 hours. And very clearly, um, the difference is shown there in the survival curve with the nebulized group having a higher proportion who remained off um, ventilation during that time. So infants treated with that nebulized surfactant less likely to be intubated in the first 72 hours. The number actually failing CPAP was 22 out of 32 in the CPAP only group versus 13 out of the 32 in the CPAP plus surfactant group. And that gave us a risk ratio of 0.53 with confidence intervals that didn't cross one. However, when we look at the subgroup analysis for that, we could see quite clearly that most of that effect was in the more mature uh, group with only one infant failing CPAP in the uh, nebulous surfactant group uh, compared to 10 out of 13 failing in the um, CPAP only group with a risk ratio of 0.25 and uh, confidence intervals as given there. The more immature group, there was no difference in the intubation uh, requirement for the two groups uh, with a risk ratio of 0.86 and confidence intervals relatively wide crossing one. However, I would point out that the nebulized group shown in red here, uh, when they failed, tended to fail later than the uh, group that received CPAP only, suggesting that there may well have been a physiological effect of the um, nebulized surfactant in that group. We look at the clinical status at the failure of CPAP and uh, for pH, CO2, respiratory rate, FiO2, and the amount of uh, CPAP that they were actually on, there was no difference in terms of any of those parameters. If anything, the nebulized surfactant group were slightly better at the time that they were intubated, uh, which certainly indicates that we weren't uh, biased in terms of um, there was no uh, contamination with the clinicians knowing which group was which and uh, preferentially later intubation of this uh, surfactant group. The reason for failure when uh, looked at the, which of the failure criteria they failed on, I can see the only one that failed in the more mature group was because the clinician decided that the baby was working too hard um, and this baby was intubated in the notes according, uh, according to the notes for uh, tachypnea. Um, in the more immature group, uh, they either failed for exceeding the FiO2 limits or uh, predominantly because of clinician assessment that the baby actually was working sufficiently hard and was in enough distress that it warranted uh, receiving surfactant. Secondary outcomes, um, no difference in terms of the proportion of infants who were intubated at the 24, 72, seven day group. This is because a number of those who were intubated uh, were actually rapidly extubated again. The time to intubation, sorry, was um, significantly different between the groups with a much later intubation in the nebulized surfactant group. And I think that this number is interesting and has ramifications for the future dosing intervals uh, for this 11.6 hours uh, from birth is when that they failed. We had a redosing criteria of 12 hours from the time of their first dose. And that, because that was standard for uh, intubation, uh, Curacef redosing in our unit. So arguably, if you're going to reduce with nebulization, perhaps it needs to be done earlier. There was no difference in the overall uh, duration of mechanical ventilation between the two groups. If we restrict that analysis to only those babies who are intubated, then the nebulized group were intubated for about six hours longer. Um, probably reflecting the fact that they were intubated slightly later in their course. But I'd urge you to um, take that outcome with caution because we did not mandate any extubation criteria and therefore um, there weren't any firm criteria for extubation. The time to room air was uh, slightly longer in the nebulized surfactant group and in part this reflects uh, the fact that the control group, as soon as they got intubated, given they were relatively mild RDS, actually were weaned to air very, very quickly. Uh, surfactant dosing, not surprisingly, um, there's a difference in terms of nebulized by design. You can see the bolus um, surfactant, more bolus surfactant was given to the control group. The um, secondary outcomes for any of the other adverse outcomes of uh, prematurity were not different. 
So, in summary, uh, we saw no major adverse uh, effects. I will note that we saw transient rises in the uh, TCM CO2 levels that resolved very rapidly as soon as we lift at the mask. Uh, and only one baby during the study uh, had an apneic uh, episode that required us to briefly lift the mask, stimulate the baby, and then continue with the procedure. Uh, overall, the study procedure was very well tolerated. The therapy was very, very simple to deliver. So nebulized surfactant in the first four hours of life in moderate, very preterm infants with mild RDS reduced the relative risk of intubation in the first 72 hours. There's still quite a lot of work to be done in this therapy in terms of determining the optimum dose, the redosing interval, the delivery rate, refining the patient interface so that we don't um, uh, have a problem with CO2 accumulation whilst also avoiding the impaction of surfactant, uh, and that's one of the problems with delivering this via cannulae. Um, and we also, perhaps in the future, will be looking forward to a non-inferiority uh, trial, perhaps comparing nebulization to uh, insure or some other uh, less invasive surfactant therapy approach. So many thanks to uh, the parents of babies who are involved in the trial, um, our funding bodies. A, a big, huge thanks to Stefan Minichieri, who I have to say, without whom this trial would not have proceeded. He was more than happy to come in at 2 o'clock in the morning to randomise babies to this trial, and really his dedication needs to be uh, acknowledged. Um, I'll leave by... Um, inviting you all to join us at the Perinatal Society of Australia New Zealand meeting, which will be held in Perth next year, and you can come see some of the beautiful scenery for yourself. Thank you.